Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Cruising Korea. This exciting webinar will update agents on all the highlights that Cruising Korea has to offer. Be sure to attend the full duration of the webinar for your chance to win one of two $500 e-gift cards. Everyone attending the webinar from start to finish will receive a $10 e-gift card as well. Just before we get into things, I'd like to let our viewers know that during this webinar, you'll have a chance to, to direct questions to Randy. To do so, just type them into the Q&A section or the Q&A tab of the public chat box, which should be towards the right-hand side of this page. And those questions will be answered in due time. And remember, this is a live session, so your patience is appreciated during any technical difficulties that might possibly arise. Presenting today is Randy Snape, Senior National Marketing Manager at Korea Tourism. Hi, Randy. How are you today? Good, Dan. How are you? I'm great, thanks. So uh, feel free to get started whenever you're ready. Great. Well, I want to start by thanking everyone for coming today. Uh, it's, I know, a cold day in Toronto for many of us. For those who are joining from elsewhere, I hope you've got uh, better weather than we do. Today, we're talking about the best of weathers. We're talking about cruising, of course. And whenever you think of cruise, you think of beaches, you think of uh, sitting by the pool, you think of anything that is warm. And so I thought there would be no better time than winter to talk about cruising. So as Dan was saying earlier, if you guys have a question, please put it into the chat box. And um, actually, Dan will probably be asking me that live at that time. Some of your questions can be, uh, of course, saved to the end as well. So feel free to ask those questions at any point should they come up. So we're going to start today with cruising and all about cruising. Now, when we first came up with the idea of today's webinar, we thought, well, there are cruises that go to Korea. A number of agents have been asking of us about cruises for a number of years now. This is probably something that we should cover. And so we started collecting all the questions that we get from agents and that we've had from agents at not only travel shows, but also from consumers when it came to our cruise show that we've attended uh, the last couple of years at Cruise 360 in Vancouver. And so this is a collection of all of those questions and their answers in a presentation format. So we'd start with a hello, and we get this one quite often too. How do you say hello in Korean? So 안녕하세요. But we're going to start with the location of Korea. And oftentimes when you're looking at cruises for Korea, you're looking at Japan and China, you're looking in the middle between those two. So we're looking at Korea, the area of East Asia. And this is one of the reasons over the years that we've been so popular with travel agents when it comes to stopovers. Uh, is just because we're so centrally located. For a lot of these destinations, when it comes to stopovers uh, that you see on the screen here, there is no way to get to them directly. You would actually have to take a stop somewhere in Northeast Asia, and therefore that's why Korea is key for it. Uh, during my fam trips that I've been to Korea, I've actually run into a number of people that are traveling to Australia and they've taken a stopover in Korea. I've met people that were on their way to uh, very popular destinations, of course, like Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Singapore, Malaysia, etc. cetera. Uh, but I've also run into people that are going to New Zealand as well. Uh, people do do this through Asia and they've been using Korea as a stopover destination for that. So they spent a couple of days to that prior. Um, some quick facts about the country. Uh, so just our time zone, for example. So if you, depending on where you are in Canada at the moment, just give you a current Korea time. At the moment, it is 3.05 a.m. in Korea. A population of roughly 50 million people. Capital city, of course, is Seoul. And uh, you can read the rest. You don't need me to do it. But when we talk about pricing, and if there's any questions about pricing today, one Canadian dollar, it's written as 851. I usually do it as about 1,000 because the exchange rate varies so much. That means that 1,001 would roughly be one Canadian dollar. It just makes it easy for conversion when we're talking about pricing. We do have four seasons, and I've uh, you'll see here that I've talked about the monsoon season. Now, when I say that uh, our monsoon season is July, I mean typically it is the end of July, and so that's something to be mindful of. But we do have those crisp, clean, uh, uh, I should say, falls and uh, springs, so the cherry blossom season, we do have that as well. Um, the fall, of course, beautiful foliage that you see throughout the country. Winter, there is snow. Remember that Korea did host the 2018 Winter Olympic Games in Pyeongchang. So you do see in the bottom right-hand corner here that there is snow. Now, not a lot of you will be cruising during the winter. Uh, typically, those are spring, summer, and fall. But winter, I suppose it can happen as well. Uh, and, of course, the very, very hot and humid summers that Korea experiences with lush tea, green tree, or green tea farms. Safety is always a big question that we get from agents, especially when it comes to cruises too. What's it like at the ports? What's it like downtown? Do my clients need to be careful? Should they be wearing a, a hip sack, et cetera? Should they hide their passport inside them? There's so many questions and I understand why these questions come up. Um, I've been 
selling. I should, but we'll, we'll just give you a little bit of my history. Uh, I lived in Korea from 2002 to 2010. Uh, during those eight years in Korea, I think I've had more problems in Canada than I ever have in Korea. It's a very safe destination to travel to. Uh, there is, of course, um, some crime that takes place. And I'm not saying that, you know, you go testing what I'm telling you today about how safe a destination is by walking down a dark alley at night in, say, for example, the port city of Busan. Don't, don't do that. But what I am saying is that it is very easy to get around and do so safely. Um, if you're minding yourself and minding your possessions, you will be just fine. Uh, it's still very much one of those destinations where you to leave your wallet in a taxi, you may find it uh, dropped off back at your hotel the next day. Cell phones, for the most part, if you were to leave them at a restaurant, you would still come back and you would find them either A, still at the table, B, at the front desk. It's very safe that way. Uh, and I would say that crime is fairly low in comparison to what we find a lot of uh, problems that we have in Canada. Accommodations, we have all of your luxury resort style accommodations, all your major international name brands, as well as some Korean ones as well. So if you're looking at a stopover on the way to perhaps starting a cruise, this is a great way to, try, uh, to do it as well. And we have a lot of unique experiences too. So this is something you wanna to wanna to talk to your clients about when they're looking at shore excursions. And that's what I'm gonna to get to in a little bit. I'm gonna cover for you today three port cities and the shore excursions and tours that your clients can look at for those areas. Uh, this is a very important one that we get from a lot of people that are coming in because we know that when it comes to a shore excursion, you don't have a lot of time, but you do want to be able to talk about the destination. Then you also want to know who in Canada might be selling those private shore excursions. So these are some of the questions that I'm going to try and carry or cover for you today. So unique experience is cuisine. When it comes to Korean cuisine, it's always a matter of looking at the healthfulness. But I should say that presentation is very important as well. So this is an example of royal cuisine. Um, different, you see everything from fish to the fresh vegetables to all different types of kimchi, for example, that you'll see there. For anybody who doesn't know what kimchi is, that's that pickled cabbage, but they also do make it with other, uh, and it's of course spiced as well, but uh, they do make it with other vegetables as well. It's not just cabbage that they make it with. We have a variety of attractions. Um, so when it comes to Korea, we always sell ourselves as a destination that has something for everyone. We are an amazing shopping destination. And if you've ever done a Korea tourism presentation in the past, you'll know that we do talk a lot about shopping and all the different markets that are available. And we really do have a market for just about everything. We have a lot of adventure sports. So especially if you're looking at the areas of Jeju, which we'll talk about today, lots to do there. We have some great nightlife, uh, the nature again with Korea, depending on what area of the country you're looking at. And then there's cultural activities, wellness, entertainment. We have truly something for everyone. We're also a destination that hosts 13 UNESCO World Heritage Cultural Sites, but we housed one natural site as well. And we'll be talking about the island of Jeju, that natural site, briefly today. So the cruise lines that go to Korea, I've listed them on the screen for you. I'm sure you've, uh, anybody who's tuned in today, you know these cruise lines. You've sold them many a times before. Uh, and of course, these are the ones that are all going to Korea. These are your major ones. So what we've tried to do is take a look at those ports that these particular cruise lines are stopping in. Here are all the port cities for Korea. So the Korean ports of call, for example, you've got five major ports, but there are a total of 12. The three that I'm going to cover for us today are Incheon, which you see off to the uh, west coast, the our Busan, which is in the southeast coast, and of course, Jeju, which sits off the southwest coast and is an island. Those are the three that we're going to be covering, and we're going to be covering specific ports within those major port cities. The reason for that is, like I mentioned earlier, these particular cruise lines, this is where they're traveling to, and this is where North Americans are going when they're on these particular boats. We're going to start today with the island of Jeju. This is by far one of my favorite places to visit. And to give you a little bit of background about the island of Jeju, like I mentioned earlier, it's the southwest coast of Korea. The island of Jeju is actually completely formed of volcanic rock. It is Korea's only natural UNESCO World Heritage Site. Uh, it has been the wonder, a winner of the seven natural wonders of nature. Um, this is where Koreans went. They used to call this Honeymoon Island because this is where they went on honeymoon before international travel was actually allowed for the destination. 
very large island. When I say large, oh yes, it takes you about three hours max to drive from the east coast to the west coast and vice versa. North to south, you're looking at about an hour. Uh, so it all depends on where you're going. So we're going to cover two different areas today. We're going to cover the Jeju port as well as the Salguipo port. So off the north coast and off the south coast. Those are the two that we're going to cover today. And we're going to cover all the different little uh, areas and uh, tourist attractions that can be visited. So the one that we're going to start with today, of course, is Manjang the caves. Now these are lava tubes. So you can call them the lava tubes, but this is one of the reasons that Jeju Island is considered an, a uh, natural UNESCO World Heritage Site. These tubes or lava tubes were what actually formed the island millions of years ago. And so you can actually descend into them. Now they are well protected. Um, they, I believe it's the first one kilometer of the 7.1 kilometers of the tube that is open or the cave that is open to the public. There is a major temperature difference when you go into this. And so you're seeing the way that the, uh, the island is built. But when I say temperature difference, we're talking about a 15 degrees Celsius difference. So you're actually almost chilly when you're down there in the summer because you might have 35 degrees with humidity when you're above ground and you're outside in the sun. But when you get down in there, it is quite cool. The next one we're going to stop at is Sunrise Peak. Now you'll notice that throughout today's presentation, I'm going to give you the nicknames for each one of these destinations. And the reason I'm going to do that is it's easier for you to remember. If you were to contact any of the Canadian tour operators that sell these shore excursions or destinations, etc., to make a private package for you, they will understand these nicknames that I'm giving to you. It just makes it a little bit easier as you for agents to remember the names that we're talking about today, as well as sell them to your clients. So uh, this Sunrise Peak, for example, now this is probably not the best way to look at it, the angle. I'm going to give you another picture in a moment, but it is quite the hike to get up there. And this is something that Koreans will do, uh, especially on New Year's Day, but especially when they're on, uh, most specifically when they're on vacation, they visited Jeju Island, uh, they will sit down uh, and watch the sun rise. And that's why, of course, it's called Sunrise Peak. Remember that the entire island is not far from uh, Seoul, you're looking at a, roughly a 45 minute flight. So by the time that they've taken off, they've, you've had a coffee, you're landing again in Jeju Island. It really is not far from the mainland. Uh, and so of course, all, along comes with that a lot of the technology that would be with it as well. So don't expect that you're looking at a third world area when it comes to visiting Jeju. It very much is first world, much similar to what you would experience if you were to visit Seoul, the capital. But when we're looking at the Sunrise Peak, again, this is something you would want to do for your first, th to visit the sunrise first thing in the morning. So there's an idea of what you're looking at from an aerial viewpoint. Just a stunning, stunning area. No tour could be complete, especially if you're going to do a shore excursion without going and doing uh, a market of Korea. Now I understand that you can't bring fresh fruits and vegetables back. I do get that, but this market sells more than that. This particular market, and there are markets throughout the island, uh, is something that your clients are going to do just to see all the different varieties that are popular on the island. Now you'll notice that I took a picture of the oranges and there's a reason for that. Remember that I said that it's a, the only natural UNESCO World Heritage Site that Korea has, but it is also semi-tropical. And that's why you find those very large and very sweet oranges that you see in the image below. So there's lots of different stuff to see in that they do make uh, orange chocolate there. You also find that they have uh, green tea is very popular. Uh, there's lots of different things that you can find within the market. Here are a couple of popular ones, uh, everything from different types of kimchi to spices. So you get to a feel for the local life and local culture, what they eat, what they go through. Uh, and of course, there's seafood in the top right hand corner because again, it's an island. Of course, seafood is going to be a very popular dish there as well. Ah, one of the beaches. Now, of course, no visit is quite like visiting the beach. And the reason I highlighted this particular beach, very popular with tourists and locals. Uh, you get an idea of the island life. And of course, you can see the windmills in the back there or uh, and try and give an idea of where the electricity for the island comes from. Uh, but I think this is a popular one at our beach as well is because you get an idea of what the local landscape is like. There's that volcanic rock that I was mentioning earlier. Now, for those who have heard of Jeju Island, this is not uh, the particular area we're going to find the diving women of Jeju. Now, this is another experience that can be had um, and an area that is not too far from the port as well. So to give you an idea, these are the diving women of Jeju. Now, the average age of these women is around 72 years of age. Uh, they dive anywhere from six to eight hours per day, 10 months a year, and they're able to hold their breath for up to two minutes and dive up to 10 meters. 
Uh, it is typically or traditionally the women that do this, not the men. And it is a dying out trade. So this is one of the reasons that the Korean government is looking to push this. Now, there are diving experiences that you can do together with these ladies, and they will show you how to dive just like they do. Um, there's an example, but here's me doing exactly that experience on my way to it. So like I said, there are lots of different things for Korea to, uh, that has to offer for all different varieties of clients, depending on whether they're looking for shopping, whether they're looking for local experiences, Korea has a lot to offer. For Jeju, we do also have local delicacies as well. So I'm just going to highlight two for today. The first one is, of course, seafood. Um, there are so many varieties of seafood. Uh, the other one that I want to highlight for today and make it easier when it comes to name for you is in the bottom left-hand corner. For anybody who's ever had Korean barbecue before, this is a special type. This is not your typical pork. This is actually black pork, which is unique and native to the island of Jeju. And it's typically black pork that's eaten there, not the pink uh, pork that we're used to. Very different flavor, different taste to it. So something that's truly a delicacy for a lot of uh, visitors. The next port city we're going to talk about today is the area of Busan. Now, this is the fourth largest port city in the world, and it is Korea's largest port city. Very, very large. Now, for anybody who drives a Kia or drives a Hyundai car, has a Samsung or an LG television, this is the port that this these electronics, these automobiles are coming out of. Um, it's a very, very large port city off the southeast coast. And so there's an idea of where it is. Some of the popular things to do from Busan. Now, the actual cruise terminal is sits very close to downtown. That's one of the nice things about it. There are free shuttle buses that will take your clients downtown, which is not the same for all other um, uh, port cities in Korea, for example. Busan is a great port to stop at just because of its proximity. There's lots to do in and around the area. Now, of course, this particular temple is not downtown, but this is a selling feature and a highlight that a lot of people like to hear about. This is one of those Buddhist temples, Korean Buddhist temples, that sits oceanside. It's one of the only ones in Korea and so truly unique in that way. There's also not to be missed, and you will find a lot of tourists that will go and do this. And this is one of the reasons you want to sell your clients on, and I'll explain in a second, on um, making sure that they have a escorted, or I should say guided tour of the markets. This is the largest seafood market in Korea, Chakalchi Seafood Market, or the seafood market, yes, is um, it is the largest seafood market in Korea. But we find that a lot of the tourist bus will drop them off here, for example, or the cruise terminal bus will drop them off but they don't know what they're looking at they're not sure how or what types of seafood they do you do see all the signs that you see in the pictures here of uh, what types of uh, fish example that would be in korean but there's no one to translate for them and that's why these people need you uh, if you are going to this is one of those areas that would be very nice to have a privately escorted tour just for that particular shore excursion sell your clients on this this is one of those things that you can say look you can go and see the market but you're not going to know what kind of fish you're looking at or how it's to be eaten or how they prepare it this is something that a guide can explain for you some of the different types of seafood now yes that is moving in the bottom right hand corner um, the reason we bring this particular one up is in 2019 it was last year actually the korea tourism organization our company uh, did a survey with all outgoing foreign tourists so that i should say international tourists is probably the friendliest way of looking at that and uh, asked what the must eat food for korea would be and of course this ranked number one so live squid or octopus this was a very very popular one i truly enjoy this especially the soju but different types of seafood as well everything from raw seafood or raw i should say uh, different types of seafood and of course barbecued as well i mean you can eat seafood in so many different ways but the market is something that is not to be missed Hyundai Beach. So this is another one, very, very popular. Uh, that building that you see at the very end in white, that's actually the Weston Hotel. It sits right at the end of the beach. Um, beautiful, beautiful area. Uh, you'll see that there is a boardwalk. On the other side of the boardwalk running around the right of the beach, you'll find that there is a road. And on the other side of that, there's covered in cafes and restaurants. Very, very popular place for Koreans and tourists alike. A nice relaxing day at the beach. You can do um, a little bit of uh, cafe hopping, restaurant hopping, etc. So it doesn't matter what time of year it is. It's a very clean beach as well. Um, great for swimming for kids, especially simply because it stays fairly shallow. And you'll actually see all the boys for the no swim line uh, that's out there in the ocean on the left. And they do. It is lifeguarded as well. 
if you're looking to do a tour of the actual city and get an idea of what the tour the city looks like here's an example of Yongdusan Park so this is what I call Pusan Tower so this particular tower up at the top of the tower you're actually able to see down and you're able to see much of the area including that port that I was talking about the actual port where all of those um, not the cruise port but of course all of those um, cargo carrying vehicle or vessels are parked to load up all of those TVs etc that is being exported out of Korea and this is an example of one of those viewpoints so you're seeing the culture village right down you're able to see all the different varieties all those little cafes those little shops the different colors of the buildings you can see them all from the top of the uh, Busan Tower Again, recommended eats. There's always something in each particular area. So there's fish cake, uh, different types of um, uh, black buckwheat noodles, for example. It all depends on what your clients might be interested in eating. I'm going to give you a quick selling tip on this particular one when it comes to Korea and it comes to food. If you're looking at something that is red, it is typically spicy. It's the easiest way to remember it. Uh, I find that Korean food, a lot of people have this impression that Korean food is always spicy. It, it's not. It, it's only spicy if truly it is either A, have garlic in it, and I mean raw garlic at that, or B, it is red. That's the only time really that you'll find that it's spicy. There are other rare occurrences, but do let your clients know that because that's a common misperceived perception. The last port city that we're going to cover today is the city of Incheon. Now, this is a port city that is very close to Seoul. And the reason we bring it up in this way and we say Incheon is because we want to make sure that some boats or some cruise vessels will state that it's Incheon they're stopping, stopping in. Some will state that it's Seoul, which is not possible. And some of them will state it's Incheon bracket Seoul. And so there's a lot of confusion about that. And so we want to clear that up for all the agents out there. You actually are stopping in Incheon but it is only about an hour and 15 minutes or so, depending on traffic from downtown Seoul. So it all depends on the client's perspective because the majority of people are going to do, if they're in Incheon, they are going to do that stop in Seoul. They want to visit that, uh, they want to do a shore excursion or they want to go and visit the, uh, a tour of Seoul. And so that's where they want to visit. So what I've done today is I've divided it up into two different sections for you. I've got Incheon and we'll talk a little bit about what's in Incheon for them to see because there's a lot of clients that are worried about, oh, I'm going to miss the boat oh I don't want to go too too far and then there's those who are willing to venture down to Seoul and that's a lot of clients so we're going to start first with Korean ports of call in Incheon uh, first is the terminal it's actually a brand new terminal it is simply stunning here's all the different types of things that are able to do it just within the area of the terminal the terminal is actually not all that far from the airport and everything from sports complexes to markets there's an underground shopping center chinatown we're going to talk about a little bit there's just so much to see in Incheon itself so if your clients feel that oh you know i have to get to seoul but i feel it's uh, it's too much and we're just going to stay in Incheon, don't Feel, uh, don't let them feel that they're missing out because they truly can do a very good experience of Korea and Incheon without going to Seoul as well. So to give you an idea, there's also a temple that they can go and visit, experience Korean Buddhist culture. Uh, Chinatown, again, many areas of the world do offer Chinatown, but one of the things that's uh, truly unique about Chinatown is just the look and feel of it. It's a very different from what you would find of a Chinatown from North America. A market is something that your clients do not want to miss, just with the street food variety that's available there, as well as all the different types of snacks and whatnot. We also have Songdo Central Park. This one is simply stunning. Uh, if your clients are looking for a quick stroll, they want to get off the beach, or I shouldn't say the beach, the boat, and they may want to get off the beach as well. Uh, this is a great place to go to. The Central Park area has a Hanok Hotel, so a traditional Korean hotel. Um, traditional Korean house hotel that sits right along the uh, the river and so many beautiful buildings. A lot of people have compared it to um, Central Park in New York. Uh, Paradise City, there's a, of course a casino not far and this particular casino is also a hotel and resort but they have more than 1,000 different examples of art throughout the uh, the resort area. So it's all littered throughout the whole area and it's uh, some very unique ones, as you can see from the outside of the building itself. 
if your clients were to do a day trip to Seoul, here's what we would recommend from it. So there's a number of different options for them, but just so you get an idea of what there is to do. We're gonna start first with uh, Gyeongbok Palace. So this is the largest of all five palaces in Seoul and a very a big highlight for a lot of people simply because they do the changing of the guard ceremony. Now you're gonna have to be careful with uh, whether you talk about that too much depending on the time. Remember, it takes about an hour and a half, hour and 15 minutes, an hour and a half to get to downtown Seoul and then you need to get to this particular palace. They only run the changing the guard ceremony at two different times during the day. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it is 9 and 11, and there is a shorter ceremony that takes place around 1 o'clock. Uh, if you want to send me an email, I'll give you my contact details at the end, and I'll be able to confirm those times for you. But you want to make sure that those times overlap. Otherwise, they might be missing the changing of the guard ceremony, and therefore your selling point for this particular area is gone. Uh, the changing of the guard ceremony, what is special about it? It's only about a 10 or 15 minute long ceremony, but it's actually the same ceremony that was done a millennia ago. Yes, it's they've really kept that culture alive through it. A lot of people like to go and visit local areas as well. So in Sadong, this particular, and some people call it the antique alley, uh, lots of different antiques in the area as well, but they do host some street food too, and lots of neat little souvenirs. Typically, this is that area that people find in Seoul uh, to bring a little piece of Korea back with them. So from handmade, hand-painted hand fans to little statues, sculptures, um, metal chopsticks are a very popular one for Korea because traditionally it was Korea that used metal chopsticks. Japan would use wooden chopsticks and for China they would use plastic chopsticks. Blanked out there just, just to see if uh, you guys could get the answer as well. <coughs> Excuse me. But lots of different options for you. So when it comes to Insadong, it's that little area that you're going to find for your clients to bring something home from the destination for them. Next one is a day trip to Myeongdong. Now this is that modernization that you're seeing. All the different people, very popular area. This is the cosmetics alley or uh, the shop, one of the major shopping districts. This is where people typically go to find their cosmetics. So from their BB creams, their CC creams, their mass packs, etc. It's all going to be in the area of Myeongdong. Now, it's not just cosmetics that's sold here. Uh, a lot of clothing, name brand clothing, is sold here as well. But it's a very, very popular place to go and visit. Uh, if you've got clients that are interested in going, but the husband's all oh, dragging his feet, he doesn't want to go shopping for. They've got coffee shops in the area too. But that's one of the great pla greatest places to go and uh, do some people watching. But like I said, again, that street food is something you want to see. And this is a great area to do it in. Dongdaemun is another market. Now, this is that midnight market. So if your clients have an overnight here for any reason, um, it's not just overnight that it's open. It's actually open for the most part 24 hours. Its main hours are between the hours of 10 p.m. and 5 a.m. That's right, 5 a.m. Uh, traditionally, this is the wholesale market of Korea. And so for this particular area, you see the three buildings, but there's actually five buildings that used to spill out into the streets. Now it's um, all organized inside the buildings, but each floor is dedicated to a different type of shopping, whether it be uh, the first floor, typically for most of them, are their uh, women and sometimes men's latest fashion but then you would move to the second and third floor it might be men's shoes the next one two floors would be women's shoes the next two floors after that would be um, women's accessories like uh, earrings or necklaces or hairbands and the next two floors after that might be men's suits and each building is like this a very very large area lots of different um, things to go and see in Dongdaemun and this is where you're going to find your up-and-coming designers a lot of them as well Namde Moon Market, traditional market. Uh, so a little bit of everything in this area as well. Some fantastic uh, examples of food. This is where I go and buy glasses. Um, the glasses actually, and this is the reason I'm wearing glasses today. These glasses, I'll give you a quick uh, quiz. I know you can't answer me, but get a number in your head. For me to go and buy my glasses, the ones that I'm wearing today, what do you think the total cost was for lenses, frames, and the test? Get a number in your head. Think about what it would cost you here in Canada. Now, keep in mind, my prescription is not very thick. I know that that makes a difference. Uh, I think I'm when it comes to contact lenses, I'm about minus four and a half, if I'm not mistaken. Something like that, four, minus 4.25. So they're not very thick lenses. And I always go with the cheapest lenses, and they do a standard uh, anti-scratch coat anyway. But how much do you think it costs for the glasses? Brett says 60. Uh, Lisa says 20. Another person guessed 50. And uh, then we have a couple more guesses. In Canada, 300, and someone else said 70. Wow. 
I've got some good answers in there. Uh, these are one of my more expensive pair. It cost me 40,000 won. So ballpark, ballpark about 40 bucks. And that includes the test. And you would think that the test is difficult. Um, it would be difficult to understand them based on language. If you think about what you do for a test in Canada for it, you put your chin in that little machine and you stare at the balloon or the farmer's field and it kind of focuses and unfocuses. That's the same test that you would go through in Korea. Then you go to the back and you would look at a screen that um, it would, I think it's a little projector or something, and it's got different letters and numbers, and those are English letters and the numbers that are up there. So of course, if it's an E, it's an E, right? And you just have to be able to read it out so they can get an idea. And number one is better, or number two is better. It's exactly the same here as, uh, as it is in Korea. So yeah, about $40 is my total cost. So this was a very popular one for me to buy in this area. The cheapest I've ever paid is about 20. Uh, I've been with clients that have spent a lot more. The key here is if you, um, if you're looking for glasses and you wear very thick lenses, your the thick lenses to try and get those really thin ones out of it is going to be very. Uh, it's going to be expensive, similar to what you would pay here in Canada. You're going to save yourself money if you're wearing those normal sized lenses. But some other things that are available in the market, uh, some great seafood as well, or uh, not seafood, sorry, street food. Um, they do a lot of uh, different types of clothing too. Uh, it's a really, it's a traditional market, but it's a market that has just about everything in and around the area. And the last one that I'm going to mention for today, and this is our last stop. And you notice I talk about all the different types of shopping, but if you're going to experience Korea, you want to experience all the different facets of it. I talked a little bit about the uh, the markets. I talked a little bit, well, actually a lot of the markets, I should say. I talked a lot about uh, the palaces that are out there, the different types of uh, the Buddhist temples that you can go and see. But the only thing I didn't really talk enough about, I feel, is the food. And that's a huge highlight for the destination. So the last one we're going to cover today is Gwangjong Market. Um, they sell all different types of food. Uh, everything from street food to actual meals, very affordable. The average cost is about $5 per bowl. Um, and if you're interested in seeing what types of food they have available, we've been pushing this. I don't know if anybody's seen the e-blast for this in the last couple of days. Um, here's some of the foods, but we have a live food tour of Gwangjong Market uh, up and coming very soon. Uh, I'll give you details about that in the next slide, but here's some of those different types of foods. So in the top left-hand corner, we have kimbap. Some people say, oh, it's sushi. Well, it's not sushi. It's a Korean different version. It's very sim uh, similar to it, but it's certainly not sushi, I can assure you. Um, different types of pancakes or what they call Korean pancakes, uh, deep-fried seafood, um, and uh, deep-fried squid I see there. There's mandu, or mandu. there's, um, what do you call those, dumplings, fried dumplings, I guess. Uh, in the top or bottom right hand corner, you would see the rice cake. That is a spicy rice cake and sometimes there's fish cake mixed in there with it. Lots of different types to explore. Um, but they serve more than just this. So if you have an opportunity, sign up. We've got our uh, live foodie tour and this takes place next Tuesday. For anybody who's joining us, you'll see the times in the bottom right hand corner here. Um, 5 p.m. 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We're doing a live food tour. This is actually a guide that we've been working with a fair bit in Korea, and his name is Yui. He will be walking us through the market, um, the different types of noodles, what seafood is there. Uh, he's going to talk a little bit about uh, Korean culture. Uh, maybe you might learn a little bit of Korean at the same time, how to exchange money with a, a vendor, etc. They do a lot of different things throughout the video, but I highly urge you to join. So I'm going to leave that up on the screen for just a second there. But you can see the um, the sign up form under foodie-tour or foodie-tour under kntio.ca. So I'll leave it up there for a sec. Uh, that concludes my presentation for today. Like I said, we were just going to hop through a few of the popular port cities and those tours that are available for them. The only thing I missed is partners. Who sells Korea when it comes to private shore excursions? Who can do that? Well, to be honest, anybody in Canada who can, sells a tour of Asia more than likely sells Korea. There are very few companies that don't nowadays. We've been working really hard on that for the last, I wanna say five years or so, to try and expand our offerings within the Canadian market. So regardless of who you normally work with, if they create their own Korea package, they will be able to create a private shore excursion for you. There are a lot of companies out there. If you're looking for a specific list or recommendations, I can't do recommendations, but I can provide a list. Send me an email. You'll find my contact details on, right here on the screen for you. And that is it for today. So if anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to bring them forward. Um, Dan, are you there?
Fantastic. Thank you so much, Randy. And a Thanks, few guys. questions have been submitted. Um, okay. If anyone else has a question, but they haven't uh, gotten the chance to ask it yet, feel free to submit it to either the chat bar or the Q&A tab, uh, which is right up at the top of the screen beside chat. And uh, firstly, we have one from Donna who asks, if clients ask us if there are Canadian foods or items like that they're familiar with, uh, are they easy to find as well? That's an excellent question. Um, yes, there is. Any North American, we'll start with fast food brand that is available, uh, for the most part, I would say, not all of them, but most of them will be available very close to your ports uh, just because they're that popular in Korea as well. So your McDonald's, your Burger King, they have a Korean version of the same thing. Uh, there are a lot of uh, Western style restaurants, whether it be Outback, I haven't seen one of those in many years here in North America, but they do have a fair number of them in Korea as well. Uh, and then there'll be a lot of street, uh, not street foods, um, but there's even hot dogs or pogo sticks that you would find on uh, within street food. Uh, you can find some of the st stuff that you're looking for, comfort foods in um, restaurants, like uh, hotel restaurants as well. Uh, there are, trying to think of some other options, American chain restaurants. Let's see, there's an Applebee's I found, uh, Ruby Tuesdays. There, there's a lot of that Canadian comfort food. I say Canadian, but um, that type of food you'll find. And you will even find when I say Canadian, uh, New York Fries, I know, is actually a Canadian company, I'm told. Uh, what are the, one of the other ones? Um, very Canadian food. Uh, you guys are testing me on this one. There's no Tim Hortons, I'm sorry. Only Dunkin' Donuts. Uh, <laughs> there was one more. Uh, oh, uh, Beaver Tails. There we go. I'm, I'm told that's a Canadian thing as well. Beaver Tails, there's a couple places you can find a decent Beaver Tail in Korea as well. Very nice, very nice. <laughs> and uh, let's see. Um, uh, Selena asks, uh, can you talk about Korean Air a little bit? Would you recommend it? Absolutely. Um, we have two carriers that go if you're looking at uh, stopovers on the way to suppose Singapore or Japan for where the cruises start. Um, Korean Air is one option, Air Canada of course being another. Uh, they both offer in-flight service but remember that Korean Air is in-flight service because they are a Korean carrier typically they are holding or carrying only Korean food. Uh, they do have a few of North American options as well whereas Air Canada more mainly North American options with a few Korean options on top of that so there's one difference there in terms of comfort very good uh, remember that Air Canada is working with uh, Aeroplan and therefore is a um, Star Alliance member but when it comes to Korean Air they're being a Sky Team member one of the founding members of Sky Team so different point systems there as well I would recommend either of them they're they're fantastic both carriers I've had positive experiences with all of them Excellent. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Randy. And um, Jean asks, are there any Korean cruise companies that just sail around Korea to visit these ports? That's a good question, Jean. There are. Um, I'd be happy to send you a list of the most recent one. Now, cruises at the moment, much like uh, all of the list I've shown you before, are not running like much of the world. Um, but Yes, if you send me a quick email, you see my, uh, I'll be happy to send you a, a list of some of them. I do want to warn you about those particular cruises, though. The difficulty in it will be they typically, if they're doing Korea only, they typically cater to Korean consumers only, and therefore the level of English is not guaranteed. Uh, it may not be all that high. And this leads me to another question that uh, some people often ask, what is the level of English like in the country? Very much like we would find in Ontario for French is probably the easiest way to look at it. Or in, um, uh, actually, I think in BC, there's a decent French program as well, if I'm not too mistaken. But you remember in elementary and middle school, and even parts of high school, you were required to take a certain level of French. Um, it's it's I would find it's better than that simply because Koreans are required to take a certain number of uh, English classes and that now starts in grade one. So there's a basic level throughout the country, but you'll find that some is very good in the capital cities and the larger cities as opposed to the smaller ones. So when you're visiting the area, of, for example, Seoul, you shouldn't have any difficulty. Even the street signs will be listed in English. But if you're visiting Busan, for example, that might be a little bit more difficult. But again, um, you're only there for, let's say, a couple of hours. You're going to be negotiating if you can't figure out the numbers in English or they can't figure them out, and they should. Don't worry about that. Uh, you can always use hand signals, etc. I, I haven't run into too many tourists that are there on cruises that ever run into a problem. But if they do and you've got an issue, 
24 hours a day, seven days a week. We have the free interpretation and travel information network. One of the first safety ones that I showed up there, 1330, that's a free interpretation number. So it's like a 1-800 number for North America, 1330, to call that up, they'll be able to translate any questions that you might have. And yes, you can use it from your cell phone as well, as long as you have a SIM card for the country or you can dial it internationally as well. Oh, that's extremely handy. Wow, very nice. And uh, there's kind of a two-parter question here from, uh, sure. uh, is there restricted travel to Korea now because of the virus? And is it possible to disembark at Busan, take the train or bus to Seoul and reboard the cruise ship there? Good question. So I'm going to start with the first one. Uh, the first question is in regards to, I should, I'm going to have to cover visas in this one, but the current situation for Canadians entering Korea. So that's a two part answer. First, Canadians were prior to the pandemic, the only destination worldwide that Korea would allow for six months entry. It was the only destination. America would be three months, uh, Australians three months, visa-free Canadians were six months. It was a special agreement between the Canadian and Korean governments. Unfortunately, when Canada shut its borders to the world, Korea looked at that as you're shutting your borders to us and we have a lot of Korean citizens that are interested in visiting uh, Canada. Therefore, we're removing you from the visa-free entry program. So at the moment, in order to enter Korea, you require a visa and consulates and embassies in Korea or in Canada, I should say, are not offering or not, um, they're not releasing visas or they're not issuing visas to Canadians. So you can go to a Korean consulate and request a visa for tourism, but they're not giving them out. They will just simply deny it. You'd pay your fee and it, nothing would happen with it. They would tell you in advance you shouldn't, but anyway. Um, unless it is an emergency situation. So for example, you have a sick family member, let's suppose that you are part Korean or your mother-in-law is Korean, for example, then in that case, they may issue a visa, but otherwise they will not be issuing tourist visas. Uh, we expect this when it, Canada opens its borders once again. And of course, the majority of consumers won't be traveling too, too much until the Canadian border opens, that this will go back to the way it was, that pre-pandemic agreement, six months visa-free entry. We don't expect any change with that. So that's that covers the first half. Uh, the second part of your question was in regards to uh, getting off the boat in Busan, taking the train up to Seoul and reboarding there. That's, right. <laughs> that's a difficult one. Uh, you'd have to check the specific requirements of a particular boat or a particular cruise line. I don't know the ins and outs to that one. Um, and normally I would call because I have a few representatives that work for the cruise lines. We deal with them quite a bit and we do joint presentations together, but unfortunately they are currently on furlough. So that's not going to happen. Um, I'll see if I can reach out on a question on that one. If you'd send me a quick email, I think that's a good one and something I'd like to know. Uh, to give you an idea of the time length, you would disembark at Busan to get you up to Seoul. If you take the normal train, it's about five hours. If you take the KTX, it would take you about two hours and 30 to 40 minutes in that range to get up to Seoul. Now you still need to get out to Incheon. Remember that the bullet train no longer travels between Seoul and Incheon. It did at the beginning, it no longer does. Uh, and that was during the Olympic times. That was a temporary thing. So you would have to transfer again. That transfer is about a 45 minute um, RX train ride, 30 to 45 minutes in there. So there is a little bit of a jaunt to do it. Uh, why you'd want to do that, I don't know, unless you wanted to overnight in Seoul, for example, that would be an option for you. But uh, do send me that question, whether you can disembark and then reboard in Incheon. I think that's a very good question. I'd like to find the answer for you. Excellent. Thanks, Randy. And let's see. Uh, Ludmila is wondering, um, she's wondering about the temperature of the sea for swimming. Ah, that's a great question. Okay. The problem with that is it really depends on the year. Uh, during the years that I lived in Korea, Pusan is specific, uh, the answer or the specific example that I'm going to give you. And the reason I choose Pusan is just because that was my second favorite city. I always wanted to move there, never did. And I think we visited like every, every four or five weeks or so, my wife and I would go out to Pusan area. We'd go either from Seoul or from Gwangju where we were living. Uh, and that was a great area to be in. Um, some Octobers, early October, mid-October, even late October, you could swim in the ocean. 
it would be cold, but you could do it uh, without being too, too uncomfortable. Other years, it's just not possible. Global warming has really changed the way you look at that. Um, I would say anywhere between 15 and 20 mid-September, or sorry, not mid-September, mid, or early to mid-October, but it really ranges. Like I've seen colder and I've seen hotter. It all depends. It's the best answer I can give you. I'm sorry, global warming has changed things so much. Of course, of course. Thanks, Randy. Uh, Shirley's asking, can you recommend some photo shops? Maybe that was an autocorrect. Can you recommend some shops which provide traditional Korean dress? Okay, I'm going to assume first that it wasn't a typo because, or autocorrect, because Photoshop, actually there are a number of shops in Seoul that you can, um, they're photo studios and there's different levels ah, right. to the photo studio. And so what they might do is you would go and get your picture taken in a professional photo studio uh, wearing traditional Korean clothing, otherwise known as a humble. So that is a possibility to do. Uh, recommend specific ones? No, I can do. The difficulty with that is it's kind of like I'm favoring one over another. But if you want to send me an email, I can give you, if you can give me a city that you're looking at for a particular port, I can give you an example of a couple that are in that area. Um, or I can also recommend you to a few tour operators in Canada that would be able to recommend, if that was your question. If that wasn't your question, you were just interested in um, rental shops for humbooks, traditional Korean humbooks, you can find those around any of the five major palaces in Seoul. And even around the base of the tower of Seoul Tower, for example, Namsan Tower, they do rent those out. And um, yeah, they, they'll, they have everything from the king's wardrobe, we'll call it, to um, it all depends on what style of humbook that you're looking for, but they'll rent them out there as well. That's great. And she says, she says, thank you. Uh, Brett asks, are there any ships home ported in Incheon? Home ported. Not that I am aware of other than the Korean ships. That's the thing. Uh, that's the mm -hmm. only answer I can really give you. And like I said earlier, the difficulty with that is they're, they're serving the majority clientele are Korean. So your clients would have a difficult time on board just because, like I said, the majority are Korean. Um, Korean meals, for the most part, um, pre-pandemic, I don't know, post-pandemic, whether they'll still be going buffet style or how they're going to do that. But even their buffet was very, very centered around uh, the Korean diet, not even the Asian diet, but the Korean diet. So those questions before about uh, different types of comfort food, Canadian comfort food, you're just not going to find that on board. Um, I'm not saying don't go for it, absolutely, but uh, send me an email and I, I'll take a look at a couple of the Korean cruise ships that are still available. Um, it's just going to be difficult to find some because, again, we haven't heard too, too much from the Korean cruises specifically. But to answer your question, no, not home ported in Incheon. Perfect. Okay. And um, speaking of which, Donna asks, if someone arrives in Korea on a ship, do they need their own visa or does the ship visa cover them? They would still need to clear um, customs and immigration, but it's a very, very, very quick procedure. Uh, it, just to give you an idea of Incheon International Airport, and I know f arriving by air is much lengthier or can be much lengthier depending on how many immigration officers they have. Um, but when they arrive at, the, uh, at Incheon Airport, they move them through very quickly. I've been off the plane collecting my bags and been on my bus going back to the hotel in less than 30 minutes. It is that quick. So that's customs, immigration, baggage claim, all within 30 minutes. It is that fast. And you will find that it's even quicker for most ports within Korea, especially Busan, just because it's so new, especially in Incheon, because it's so new. They're very, very fast with it. You do need a visa, but like I said, visa-free entry, we're expecting to go back to that once the pandemic is uh, I should say, I don't want to say over, but more under control than it is now. Uh, once all borders open once again, it should be a very, very quick procedure. But visas, no, it's you're, you are going to need a visa. There is no fee for it. It's visa free entry for Canadians. That's great. Okay, thank you. And I think um, there's uh, maybe two or three left, if that's okay sure. with you. Yeah. Great. Uh, let's see. Celine asks, are train passes available from Canada and only for Canadian residents? Question mark. That's an excellent question, Selena. I like that one. Um, so train passes, 
And the reason I like your question is because I get a lot of misinterpretation about, oh, the best thing is to go with the uh, the KR pass. That is your train pass for the entire country. In order to take true advantage of that KR pass, meaning the one that can unlimited travel with a certain uh, number of days, you really have to be moving. Let's suppose that you're going to go from Seoul to Busan and you're going to stop in Gyeongju. If you're just doing Seoul, Busan, it is not worth it for you to buy a three-day pass. It would be cheaper for you to buy the ticket individually, simply because it adds that much more cost to it. Uh, you'd look at roughly $54 one way, whereas that pass for a three-day pass is going to cost you in the $150 range. So you can see that you're paying more for the pass than you would for the individual ticket. However, if you're going to add Gyeongju to it, the more cities you add, the more expensive the individual ticket becomes. So take a look at CoRail. Dot co dot care to compare all the prices for it to give you an idea but yes uh, to answer specifically your question kr passes are available are they available just for canadians no they're available to any visitor whether it be an international visitor or koreans as well they're available to anybody worldwide um, if, but if you want to see the pricing and the eligibility like uh, how long they're valid for etc do check out corail k o r ail.co.kr you'll be able to see the pricing there and those passes are valid for the regular trains as well as well as the bullet trains amazing thanks randy and let's see um joe asks soju is a popular drink i see that they drink it in k-dramas is it a strong drink and does it taste like wine <laughs> Joe, <laughs> that's a dangerous one. Um, soju on average is between 15 and say 22%, depending on the brand and whether or not you're getting flavored ones. Flavored were much less. Uh, does it taste oh, like wow. wine? No. Uh, in my opinion, it tastes like chemical. But um, it, traditionally, it was made of sweet potatoes. Some people will tell you it's made of rice. Uh, like I said, I think it's made of chemical because of the way it makes me feel the next day. Uh, you'll find Koreans that can drink one or two bottles of it. My limit's like half a bottle. It's a very popular thing. Uh, and if you're interested in soju, we've got some great unique experiences as well where they have a soju tasting and they start you off with soju paste. It's literally a paste because it used to be it was not polite to use someone's washroom. We're talking like 100 years ago. And so they would make a paste in it because, again, if you had too much... I shouldn't say liquor, but liquid, you would need to use the washroom and you wouldn't want to do that at someone's house because that was not polite. And so they had a paste and it, during the, they work their way up to, I think it's a 90% uh, soju. It honestly is like the, the whiskey of, yeah, it's pretty intense. Wow. Uh, they do have one that tastes a little bit like wine. It's called Bekseju. Bekseju is very different uh, tasting than your regular green bottled soju that you'll find in most of your Korean dramas that you were referring to. Uh, it tastes like a, a little bit like a plum white wine is probably the best way I can describe it, but that's probably not a great description. It's, it's just the best way that I can describe it for you. Sorry. So if you're looking for that wine like taste, look at Big Siju. It's usually in a brownish colored bottle with a white label. Great. I think that definitely answers the question. Thank you. Uh, Ludmila says, I've been to China and loved it, and now Korea is calling my name. Thank you so much for the presentation. Well, thanks. Uh, not so much a question, but a comment. I love it. Thanks very much. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then John asks, are there some products that, that we cannot take out of Korea, i.e. national treasures, or bring into Canada? Though that's an excellent question. Um, your typical ones, for example, and I know you're going to think this is an obvious one, but don't try and bring anything from the National Museum. Souvenirs from the National Museum, sure, but don't try and smuggle anything out. <laughs> uh, a popular one that I get questions about, and I, I don't get it very often, there is a dog called the Chindo Dog. Um, you're not going to be taking that out. Apparently, that's a national treasure as well, and you need papers in order to get it out of the country, but most people are not bringing dogs out either. So more specifically, let's talk about um, bringing stuff. It's not that it's bad to bring it out of Korea. It's that it's difficult to get it into Canada. So that's why I always declare everything. So if you do buy kimchi and you can bring it into Canada, you need to declare it. Uh, they're looking for a certain limit. So I do bring kimchi back each and every time. Um, it would be Thank radish kimchi. I've brought back um, uh, cabbage kimchi. I've brought back 
Uh, I brought back seaweed before as well and never had a problem. I brought back anchovies, like dried anchovies, so fish essentially, but they do have a limit to how much you're able to bring back. And I've never been told the amount of that limit by um, customs officers here in Canada, so I, I don't know what that limit is. But bringing anything out of Korea, no, I haven't run into anything that you're not allowed to leave Korea with. Okay, okay, great. And we just have uh, then a couple thank you messages here from uh, Trey and from Jenny. Jenny says, extremely interesting and informative talk. Thank you, Randy. Thanks, guys. And Randy says, or sorry, Rachel says, fantastic presentation. Thank you. And the very last uh, one I'll get to here is just from Stephanie. And Stephanie asks, do the food markets accept cash or credit card? Ah, very good question. So when in Korea, Korea, I find to be very much a cash-based society. Much of the society is working towards being credit card-based like North America is, but when you're in a market, it is 100% cash. Uh, these are your small ma and pa type um, that you find that is a very older generation that's serving you. This is what they've done for the last 20 or 30 years. If anybody decides to join, I'm just going to pull it up on my screen here, this foodie tour alert, you're going to find that the guide, when he is paying for all the foods that he's trying during this, he's going to be paying in cash. And the reason for that is he might be able to pay in a few of them in credit card, but they're going to add 3 to 5% on top of it because that's their surcharge to it. That's typically what Visa and MasterCard are going to charge them. And we're talking about 5,001, you know, like a $5 transaction, a $10 transaction. If you're talking about spending a couple hundred bucks in one particular store, then yeah, I'm sure that they would, uh, they'd be willing to accept a credit card, but you'll find a lot of places will just say, no, they don't accept credit card, even though they do, because they can't afford that three to 5%, even if it's on a $5 purchase. So be prepared, do have cash. Um, and when I say cash, everywhere in Korea, any Canadian or Korean bank will accept Canadian dollars directly. There is no need to run around with American dollars and lose on the exchange twice. Canadian dollars can be exchanged directly at any Korean bank. Uh, you can do so at the airport as well. Some hotels will also do it, not all. And money changers, of course, if you're in certain markets, will do it as well. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, that, that's great. Thanks, Randy. And um, one popped up that I think um, I was going to uh, stop, uh, stop answering the questions or, ask, or reading them out, but this is a really good one. Donna asks, are there some credit cards that are not accepted at all, such as Amex? Oh, I haven't gotten that question. Donna, that's a, that's a good one. Um, Amex. I'm just thinking in my head, logos and whatnot. So when I walk up to an ATM, sometimes uh, you're, you're always looking for the picture on the back of your credit card. And so it usually says like Cyrus or uh, sometimes it's, and I'm looking at the pictures on the door. I'm picturing in my head, you know, my favorite restaurants and whatnot. I can't think of too many, but Amex is not as well accepted or as widely accepted as, say, Visa, MasterCard, and some of the other ones, like Union Pay, for example, and there's a few other ones that are coming out of China. Um, WeChat Pay, there's I think there's a few places that will accept that as well. Um, but Amex, that's a good one. You're not going to find as widely available. There will be some places, like your major department stores and whatnot, that will, but your smaller locations, I don't mean Ma and Pa, but... You're small. I'm like, I can't think, for example, that um, Dunkin' Donuts, I'm not sure if they do. I I'm going to need some time with that one. Uh, if you want to send me a quick email, I can look into it further. I'll just put it up on the screen there for you. That's that's a good question. I'm not sure. But I would say it's not nearly as accepted as Visa and MasterCard is. That's definitely good to know. Thanks, Randy. And uh, there's a question here that I can answer. Um, Someone said, sorry, I had a client come in and I was not able to view the webinar. Will this be recorded and sent? Yes, definitely. Um, we'll be distributing the recording of the webinar at some point tomorrow. So um, it takes a few hours for Big Marker to process um, um, webinars of this length just because the video files are kind of big. But yeah, we'll be sending that to you uh, tomorrow. So you can expect to get that in your inbox. And also someone had asked um, much earlier on about the uh, $10 gift card. So we do have a $10 gift card for everybody who's attended the full webinar for today. Uh, the gift card, sometimes they ask, where's the gift card from? Well, actually, we sign up for a company called everythingcard.ca. And so Everything Card has just about everything. They do, um, I think they do Best Buy, they do Walmart, they do Superstore, they do 
uh, Tim Hortons, they do Starbucks, they do, you, I, you get to choose your gift card. So what'll happen is uh, your information will be entered into the system. The system of everythingcard.ca will send you a unique code that's individual to you and you enter that code uh, to redeem for the e-gift card that you're looking for. So that'll be sent out directly to you. Uh, what we're going to do for our two $500 uh, e-gift card winners, Dan, if I'm not mistaken, you're going you to uh, draw that tomorrow. Is that right? Uh, yes, that's right. Definitely. We'll draw that from the full list of uh, people that were signed on from start to finish. Okay. So what we're going to do for that one is Dan will send me a list of the two winners. I'll reach out to them because I need you to fill out a couple forms. And uh, for our two $500 everythingcard.ca, so they're everything, basically everything, you're going to win, two people will win a $500 e-gift card. Uh, I'll need them to complete a couple forms and their permission to release their names. So I'm hoping that next week I'll be able to send not only the $500 gift card winners their gift cards next week, but also the $10 uh, for everybody who's shown up uh, at today's webinar. I hope to be able to do that next week as well. It all depends on how quickly the... Um, the e-gift card winners, the $500 winners get back to us. Uh, it sounds like it's, uh, I'm, I'm hoping it's all of you, but it, one of the difficulties that comes up is spam. Like, congratulations, you've won $500. It always ends up in somebody's spam folder. So we have to find unique ways to get around those filters. And it doesn't always work. So we ended up calling them if we have their phone number or if I've got their company email and then I see if I know somebody in the company or look it up and find out their location and try and call ahead, that type of thing. So it's not always easy to get a hold of you, but I'll do my best. That's amazing. Thank you, Randy. And that uh, pretty much wraps up today's webinar. So from all of us here at Baxter Media, I'd like to thank everyone for attending. Again, if you happen to miss part of today's webinar, the recording will be made available tomorrow. It will be distributed and it'll also be streamable on the Baxter Media YouTube channel. And um, the winners of the prize draw will be contacted sometime over the next week. Um, but I'd like to give a huge thank you to Randy Snape for this excellent presentation. Thanks so much, Randy. It was wonderful having you here virtually with us today. Thanks very much, everyone. Dan, thank you very much. Uh, just a quick note for anybody who's interested in joining our live foodie tour. Uh, again, that's next Tuesday, the 8th, uh, starting at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. You see all your time zones in the bottom right-hand corner. If you have any questions about today, you see my email at the bottom of your screen here. Do send me an email. Happy to answer. I get lots of different questions out there. We have somebody on staff that's just there to answer all of those uh, emails that uh, we get from agents. Thanks very much for your time, and have a great day. Thank you again, Randy. Take care, everyone.